Welcome to week two of the history of photography. Last week on our opening session, we discussed the origins of photography, uh, primarily Louis Daguerre and the Daguerreotype, William Henry Fox Talbot and the Calotype, and Nieppe and his very first photograph. The push was on early on for all sorts of processes. Today we think of photography, or you think of it as digitally, but for those of you who've done some analog photography, you think of silver, silver iodide, silver bromide, but there were lots of different things going on then, many of which fell out of favor, but are making a comeback now. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is collodion, the collodion process. Collodion process was developed in 1851 as a replacement to albumin, which we'll talk about in a minute, by Frederick Scott Archer. It was gun cotton dissolved in acid, which was extremely gooey and sticky. And initially it was used as a, as a field of band-aid system, a gooey system you could paint over a wound to hold it shut. Then with the addition of ether and um, silver iodide, it became light sensitive. So what they would do is they would paint it onto glass and with the, with the addition of ether and it was called the wet play collodion, it was, it would dry very quickly. It was extremely important to make it quickly, to expose it quickly and develop it almost on site. Otherwise, once it dried, it was useless. This is an example of a glass negative. And they would be, you would paint the collodion onto it and you put it on a drying rack. This is a drying rack. I want to be careful with this because it's my in-laws glass negatives. And you could paint the collodion on initially and you could paint the collodion on in daylight or room light. It was not yet light sensitive yet. Once it had primarily dried and it was just a little tacky, you would put the silver iodide onto it and with ether, develop it, expose it right away. You transport it in a film holder. This is a film holder for four by five film today. It has a slide, put it into the camera, pull the slide, take a picture, put the slide back in run off and develop it. These early photographers had to, they couldn't travel that far from their dark room or they took their dark room with them in the, in the form of a, of a wagon or small portable dark rooms because you had to, you couldn't be more than three minutes from dark room to camera to expose and come back and develop. So the camera was all set up, the picture was all figured out. The there were no light meters then, so they did, uh, um, it was a lot of trial and error until you figured out your exposure. And you'd make this, you'd develop this picture. It was very popular until throughout the, the 19th century. It's making a comeback now. The artist Sally Mann uses collodion for her photography. Later, I would like you to see, or I will set up the video of Sally Mann's work so you can see how she does collodion. We're going to also try and watch a little collodion video from Kodak later on in, the, in this presentation. And let's move on to albumin. Albumin is, albumin came out before collodion. It was, it was, it was, albumin is egg white. It's clear, it's sticky, and you would have to separate the white from the egg yolk and dispose of the yolk. Then you'd mix it with what they then call, what we today call sea salt, which means pure salt, not iodized salt, and silver iodide. And you paint it onto paper. This is an albumin print. The biggest problem is that they fade. They read, this is a building, obviously, I think you can see that with a, a horse-drawn carriage in front of it. But they fade, they don't last long. But it was an early print system in Germany. There was a company that made um, albumin print paper. And they say that in one year, in somewhere in the late 1880s, they went through a million egg yolks in a year, a million eggs in a year. So what do you do with a million egg yolks? They, uh, if you look at German cookbooks today, they'll tell you you need three yolks for that. You need four yolks to make that. Because, and we have this notion in our head that this uh, German baking 
a style goes back centuries and centuries. It really goes back like 140 years to when they had a million egg yolks and nothing to do with it because yolks go bad. The ambrotype. The ambrotype uh, was considered to be the cheap daguerreotype. It looks very good. I have an ambrotype here. It is, you take glass and you either paint it black on the back or you back it with black paper or velvet. And then you have collodion on the front, which is underexposed. And with a black backing, it becomes a positive. You put it in very nice cases. This picture is probably 150 years old. That one is long since gone, but here's a very sharp record of what she looked like. I'm not sure if you get this with this reflection, so you can actually see but there's a paper surface in there behind her. I'm not going to take this apart for any reason. <clears throat> um, the tin type, interestingly enough, has nothing to do with tin. It is a, well, this is Woodstock, August 22nd, 1892. It's, it's scratched in the back, but it is also collodion on silver, underexposed, and with that same dark backing, you have a metal iron, sheet of iron, by the way, photograph. These were very popular during the Civil War. You could photograph these in the field and then mail them back to your family. Picture of yourself. The exposure time was so slow that you couldn't photograph battle scenes by at all. The ability to photograph a battle scene wouldn't come about for some time until film got a lot faster. But you photograph pictures of yourself, records of your family, and you could put this into an envelope and mail it back to your family. Uh, tin types, you can actually make all these processes today. Um, last week's daguerreotype, I'll point out, is extremely poisonous. If you decide you want to do that, take a class that will, you know, so you can learn all the safety techniques. Cyanotype. Here is a cyanotype I made of a photograph I took of my father, my now late father. Um, it can be extremely deeply blue. It's called Prussian blue. And you paint it onto the paper and you expose it directly to the sun. These are all ultraviolet processes. They don't happen under the enlarger. And ultraviolet does not perform well through a lens, through glass lenses. Glass lenses can be made for ultraviolet, but they're very expensive. Either you have to be like NASA or JPL to be able to afford them. Um, if you've got any experience with architecture, you've probably heard of blueprints, which is a fast way of making duplicates of the plans to a building. And that's how these got started. They were first, uh, the, the idea was first thought up by Sir John Herschel. I'd like you to write that name down, Sir John Herschel, H-E-R-S-C-H-E-L. He was not a photographer, but he was you know, one of those geniuses of his day. He was an astronomer, a mathematician, chemist. And he came up with the idea of the cyanotype. The first cyanotypes were initially plants laid out on top of the paper and exposed and used by Anna Atkins. We'll revisit her name when we get to women in photography. And because she would write books, create books on botany and by planting, laying uh, ferns and other leaves on and making a photogram is what we would call them of the actual leaf in a cyanotype form. She could put these in her textbooks, or her books on botany and have really clean, accurate renditions of what the leaf looks like. Cyanotypes were also used for the planning, making plans for building large boats like the Great Eastern. We'll visit the subject of the Great Eastern when we get to 19th century documentary photography. But you need to have plans that are identical because the Great Eastern was a huge boat. And when you have huge things like boats and buildings, you want plans Everyone needs their own set of plans, and the plans must be identical and reliably so. So the cyanotype, this, by the way, is an iron print, not a silver print. And uh, you simply mix the cyanotype solution, put it on the paper, lay it in the sun with a negative or whatever you're going to put on top of it. 
Could it be a plant or anything else? And voila, it takes 15, 20 minutes in the blazing Southern California sun, and then you rinse it with water and you're good. Van Dyke. The same negative as that one. This is a Van Dyke, also of my father, of the same, of the same one. It's very, very brown. Now, this gets its name from the uh, 16th, 17th century Dutch master, Anthony Van Dyke, Anthony Van Dyke, who had a kind of a warm brown theme in all his paintings. Now, a couple of hundred years separates the death of Anthony Van Dyke from the Van Dyke process. So there's the relationship is, it looks brown like a Van Dyke painting. And that's about it. Also an iron print. Um, and also made in the direct sun. It's a UV process. These processes are printout processes. What does that mean? For those of you who have uh, enlarged your experience, when you expose your paper, your paper's white, then you put it in developer and you end up with an image. Light hitting the paper is, the is a step called printing. And seeing the image is, is when the image comes out. In developer, you see the image, so it develops out. Well, these print out, as in while the light's hitting, it gets darker and darker and darker, and the image materializes. So the image is printing out. Now, next on the is the Woodbury type. I didn't have my glass made. A Woodbury type is a plate with this stuff into it, which is exposed and the stuff gets really, really hard. And then you can take that plate, flip it over onto a soft piece of lead. Lead is very malleable. You can press in the lead and press it in under, you know, under a real tight press and that soft, that, that hard goo creates a very detailed high rendition form on the lead. And then you can ink the lead and print from there. As you can see, I'm going to hold this to the camera. This has a lot of detail. I'm going to get too close because the camera doesn't focus that well. It has a lot of detail. And find um, transitions from highlight to shadow is a very high quality process. It has a lot of appeal. Now, I'm going to share screen. Share screen. And let's talk about the early processes. Collodion. Collodion required a fairly large, a really large camera. Because as I said, you can't run this through any larger than if you want a big print, you need a big negative. So a, an eight by 10 print had an eight by 10 negative. A 16 by 20 print had a 16 by 20 negative, which was contacted down to make your enlargement. Collodion was poured on the glass. And this, this, the stage of pouring collodion on the glass can be done in room light or daylight. And then you tilt the glass gently till it hits all the corners, let, you put it in a rack and let it dry. You expose it. You can, by the way, the extra collodion can be poured off and saved for another for another negative. And then you have to rinse it, treat it with acid and rinse it. Albumin prints. This is the work of Julia Margaret Cameron. Julia Margaret Cameron, 19th century photographer, not the first female photographer of the 19th century, but an extremely important one. She set a lot of new rules in photography and she made her own rules. She was a pre raphaelite and would, her, a lot of her artistry was of Bible stories or, you know, King Arthur, looking back to better times. Um, these are gargoyles from, I believe, Notre Dame. Uh, this is a harem, an Arab harem. A lot of these photographers would travel and photograph uh, the antiquities and bring them back. People had no TV, they had no, you know, PBS, they had no uh, National Geographic channel. That's how they learned about these things. 
Um, this was a very slow process, so the breaking of waves could not be recorded. Any motion, it was a blur. Buildings were great because they hold their pose well. And it's interesting that it was noted early that photography records more detail than the artist with the pencil and paper does because you can't, it doesn't, nothing is hidden from the camera. The ambrotype. Uh, this is the process of collodion on glass underexposed with a paper or dark backing. And it makes it very easy positive, put in very nice cases. This picture is Abraham Lincoln after he was shot. I find this a little disturbing. And I saw, found this on eBay for a quarter of a million dollars. So I think that's, um, somehow, I think that's a little bit wrong, to be honest with you. They were in very nice display cases and kept, uh, if this is a leather, you know, union case, then it would have gone with, say, a Civil War soldier of his family as he went into battle. These nicer cases would have stayed home on a mantle. Um, it's interesting to note the styles and the postures of the day. We'll talk about this when we get into portraiture next week. His hands are both of doing something. They're resting in a place so his hands don't move and create a blur. The tin type. This one is so nice, I almost think it's a Woodbury type. So I'm suspicious it might, might be a tin type. Now this looks like a photograph of a mining town. It says not on photo, not on photo, not on photo. A re, um, Juneau, Alaska. Um, maybe it's part of the Alaska Gold Rush of 1899, I'm not sure. Now, one of the things that came about in early photography was nude photography. This happened almost rather quickly. It was on, you could be said that it was the beginnings, the early beginnings of pornography. The Woodbury type. Notice, I want you to look closely at this and see the finer detail. How nice the fabric of his, of his, the contours of his coat look, the folds in his pant leg and at his elbow. Um, the buttons, everything about this, nothing is, there's no loss of detail here. This is actually really fine. Uh, watermark is a great way to protect your work. By the way, FYI, for those of you who shoot digitally, look inside the instructions you've never read and you'll find a place to put a copyright, your copyright on your images. It's in there somewhere. And if you do a copyright, make sure you've got the current year, otherwise it's not a valid copyright. Look at his tie. Oh, he's got the perfect little sheen of the satin of his tie. And it's a record of how people dressed. You know, uh, the hat, the changing styles. Now they would have the, the aperture was effectively wide open so you could get a shorter exposure. So you have her hair is out of focus. Or his pearls are uh, out of focus. And here we go. Another example of the styles of the day. And great, con great transition of light from her highlight to her shadow showing all detail. This is Miss Gladys Humphrey. And these are, these are Woodbury types. So they were reproducible and often saved for, for uh, done for people of some importance. And let's hit stop share. And let's go over to YouTube. I'll go back to here. Have I lost my face? All right, no, I don't want to do that. Tech Connect. Open and zoom. I'd like to think I haven't lost this. Let's play this. I'd like you to see the process of how collodion is done. Up until photography, only the very wealthy who could afford to have portraits painted had any notion of what their ancestors looked like. Photography was used primarily for portraits because people is what we are primarily interested in. We see it as a very popular way to do what we've always wanted to do, which is to record the features of people we love.
I'm going to show you a collodion negative on glass. Very carefully. This process was invented in 1851 by Frederick Scott Archer. In the 1850s, you had the daguerreotype, you had the calotype paper negative. The daguerreotype was a, a commercial success. The plate that they hand the customer is the same plate that was in the camera. There's no negative. What you got with the calotype was a negative, and it was a negative that could be reproduced very easily. You could print dozens, even hundreds of positive prints from that negative, but it made a very soft photograph much less sensitive than the, the daguerreotype. You couldn't do portraits easily with that process. The desire was to have the reproducibility of a positive negative process with the precision and detail of the daguerreotypes. But in 1851, Frederick Scott Archer invented a process called the wet collodion process. The wet plate process can give you a negative to make paper prints, it can give you a direct positive plate called an ambrotype and another direct positive plate called a tintype. When you do the wet plate process, you make a glass negative and that glass negative can then be contact printed onto various printing processes and make thousands and thousands of prints. By the time you get to the late 1850s, really replaces the daguerreotype. The positive negative process won out, in part because it was more economically viable. It does require some advanced planning when you're taking it on the road. You have to have a portable darkroom. You pour the collodion on the plate, you dip it in the silver bath, and while it's dripping wet with silver nitrate, you take the picture, come back, and develop it, and you have to do all of that before the plate dries. And so the people that made landscape images, they had to carry a wagon with all of their chemicals. It was a challenge. So you can see on this negative, the pore marks, which are characteristic of the wet collodion process. See this kind of wave up here, that's a pore mark. And when the photographer poured the developer onto the glass, the camera that, that took this photograph would have had to have been quite large in order to accommodate a negative of this size. You could do a lot of things with collodion besides make a negative. You could back it with black paper or black cloth, and you ended up with a positive. These kinds of photographs, they were called ambrotypes, were generally cased and presented in the same way that uh, daguerreotypes were. You could expose a positive onto a metal plate, and for funny reasons, these were called tintypes, even though they weren't made on tin. Tintypes were one of the earliest truly democratic kinds of photography. During the American Civil War, we see hundreds, thousands of tintype images made by soldiers to send a picture home. This is a Lewis, uh, H.B. Lewis wet plate camera. It's basically your, your typical Civil War portrait camera. So it's a camera that the tintypes of the soldiers would have been made of. Photography shaped the way we remember things. It's a really important cultural change, no longer through ballads and poems and stories, but through looking at a likeness is the way we remember what happened and who was. Okay, <clears throat> this brings me to an interesting point. Last week we talked about the daguerreotype, or the first week we talked about the daguerreotype and the calotype. And we've now talked about collodion, ambrotype, cyanotype, um, Van Dyke, tintype, and woodberry type. You're, uh, for those of you who are watching the Canvas page, and I hope you all are, 
this is the beginning. You're now being assigned your first paper is to pick any two of these. Don't, don't talk about all of them. Pick any two and do a compare and contrast of the process and quality. And then submit that through Canvas. Do in about two weeks. Do in two weeks. Thank you very much. This has been a pleasure. I hope you're all having a good day, wearing your masks and being safe.